It begins with openness. The willingness to come alongside someone else, to pour out, care, invest. It's about sharing the journey, doing life together, growing, forging, becoming. It's about selflessness, caring enough to walk through the valley, even when it's painful, to love people as Christ has loved us. It's rejoicing when they rejoice, hurting when they hurt, being a hand, an encourager, a friend. We were not created to wander alone. For as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. God is an incredible God. We, I, I've entitled my message, Looking to Jesus. I get emotional when I come to liberty. In my heart, it's evangel. Uh, I entered into Evangel Baptist Church in, when I was 17 years old as a rock drummer with hair down here, driving a big Cadillac. And as I walked through that church, some of the actual saints had to sit down and gasp when they saw me. I was a wild guy. I grew up in Union, New Jersey, Vauxhall. All my uncles were cops, firemen, uh, postmen. And God reached down and did something in my life. He took a rock drummer, called him to himself. Listen to me. There's no human explanation why he called me to himself. I wasn't interested in God. I was interested in this pretty blonde I saw, which is my wife today. She had gotten saved in this church when she was 10 years old through a guy named George Sweeting. And her father was called to the ministry, Joe Iwanski. He took a church in... Clinton, New Jersey, 50 people. The church grew to 800 people. And 42 people went out and served the Lord through his ministry. I'm one of them. I was a businessman for many years. I had my own gold business. And while I was doing that, God just touched a place in my heart and said, Hey, Sam, it's time to go to Italy. I was 32 years old. And you know what my approach was? A typical Italian approach. You know what that means? I'm not going. I'm out of here and see you around. Guys, I was tra training and discipling people to follow the Lord. And if God called, called us to do anything, we should do it. Well, when God touched my heart to go to Italy, it sort of put me in crisis. Like, what do I do? But at a certain point, I realized that the best place to live Christian life is in the center of God's will. Now, to get to the center of God's will, you've got to get into the family of God. I remember when uh, Pastor Hill came walking out in his church in Irvington or Newark, came out with this book, this little black book, and he started reading from it. I turned to Joan and I said, what's that guy reading from? That's the way I talked back in those days. You know, how you doing? <laughs> I said, what's that guy reading from? He said, the Bible. I said, you actually read the Bible? See, I, I went to uh, St. Joe's Catholic Church in Maplewood and I was given a Bible and I was an altar boy and the priest said I said oh good I'm going to take it home and read it and he said oh no no you can't read it 
you just keep it. I said, well, I don't want it. Why don't you keep it? So when this guy, Pastor Hill, was reading the word, and he said something that shocked me. He said, salvation is a free gift, and nobody can do anything to earn it. And I thought to myself, in Italian, this is like, what's that guy saying? And then when I realized that to know Jesus, some of you might not know him right now in a personal way, to know Jesus means to receive him by faith, saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins and come into my life, and I'll follow you. I did that when I was 20 years old. I didn't know what it was going to happen. I just did it because I wanted to get my fire insurance so I didn't go to, wasn't going to hell. But that began an adventure. And what actually happened was God tr transformed my heart. And you know what happened? He explained to me why I was created. You see, we all are trying to figure out that big question mark. Why are we here? What is life all about? Especially when you go to bed at night and think, okay, I did this, this. But is that why I'm create, created? Well, when I found out that, and then I started walking with him, he started teaching me a very simple principle that, listen, look at this verse. He is, let's go to First Thessalonians, if you have your Bible. Five, verse 23. My God himself, the God of peace, sanctif sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord, by the way? <laughs> that trump's going to sound, and he's going to say, come on home. And if you have placed your life, your heart in Jesus' hands, we're out of here. And then it goes on to say, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Guys, when I started my adventure with the Lord back in, I guess it was around 1960, 1963, I had no idea what would happen, where I would be going, I would have never imagined that I would be going to Italy as a missionary, and I'm, we've been there 41 years. But let me tell you this. When God calls you to do something, he is faithful. That's what this passage says. And he will do it. Right now, we are in Italy, we have our church, uh, it's called the Punto Lodi Church. By the way, they said to salutarvi. You know what that means? To greet you in the name of the Lord. And they finished meeting. And our daughter church, which is about 20 minutes away, are meeting in about five minutes. And Nina and Michael Schaffsma are the leaders of that church. She's my, grand, my daughter. So my... Uh, when I came here back in 1979 to talk to Mark and the guys about going to Italy, Nina was eight, and my son Sam was 12. People said to me, you can't take your kids to Italy at that age. They're going to have all kinds of problems. You'll end up losing them. You're entering into a pagan lifestyle, and there's going to be all kinds of issues. Guys, listen to me. God is faith faithful. We raised Nina and Sam in Italy. They had no Christian friends. We had to go and start a church. They were all by themselves. But 41 years later, Nina is serving the Lord. My three grandkids, Glory, Jake, and Max, 
are serving the Lord. Max is a missionary also. So three generations of missionary coming out of Foxhall, New Jersey. It's like, how, do, what, how does that happen? And then I have a son who lives in Geneva, Switzerland. He was a banker for many years when he came here. He, he was just sort of a, a little guy. He just liked to do the right thing. And he asked me, Dad, when he finished high school, he said, Dad, what should I do with my life? There was a lot of pressure on him to be a preacher like his dad. And I said, Sam, look, here's what I'll say. Psalm 37 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I said, Sam, why don't you just do what you want? And let, you know, of course, pray and let God lead. <clears throat> and he said, okay. So he prayed, and he said, Dad, I want to go to uh, Wheaton College and study political science. Political science? <laughs> That's a double layer. <laughs> That means, what are you doing? You know, because of going to Wheaton, getting his degree, he eventually went on to Johns Hopkins. He was hired by Chase Manhattan in New York as a banker. He was transferred to Geneva, Switzerland. And he was a banker, high-powered banker for about 25 years. Listen, guys, your pastor said it. He was just serving the Lord in his church. He just said, hey, Pastor, what can I do? He started a youth group. That grew. He started all kinds of ministries. Eventually, they called him to be the pastor. So about six years ago, he left the banking world, and he's serving the Lord as the pastor of this church. He's got eight UN ambassadors in his church. And he presently is a chaplain at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. This little eight-year-old kid. God has taken him. You know why? Not because he's my son or because he's somebody special. He took a kid who decided to say, I want to do what's right. I just want to follow the Lord. I want to make myself available. And I am not a typical missionary speaker that says everybody should be a missionary. I'm not someone who says, you have to do this. You have to witness every day, five times a day. What I'd say is, God has wired you in a certain way. And he's given you certain gifts. And he wants you to be faithful and make yourself available. Uh, when Joan and I left to go to Italy, we've had a great time. We've enjoyed it. But the last 19 months have been very trying. February 28th, 2020, we had just finished our church meeting. We had, the church was filled. We were overflowing in the aisles. Uh, March 1st, I wake up. And there's a shutdown in Italy, a lockdown, like a lockdown. Nobody knew what was going on. It was the first time COVID had hit outside of China. So here we are in a lockdown. And when, let me tell you what a lockdown means. Joan and I could not leave our house, our apartment for four months. The only place we could go was go for food or go for medicine. The law did not allow us to go out on the streets. So we're in this house trying to figure out what is going on. And you know, I, we started talking. And it's obvious we are in a spiritual battle, guys. Right? That's what it says in he, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. But listen to me. There's a spiritual battle going on, but Jesus made a promise that said, I will build my church. And listen, nothing, nothing, nothing on the face of this earth is going to stop Jesus from building his church. That's an amen. Okay. 
But so here we are, sort of going semi crazy trying to figure out what do we do after about a month. I said, Joan, are we in a dream here? We can't go out. I can't talk to anybody. And after about a month and a half, I said, Joan, would you mind if I witness to you? Because <laughs> can I lead you to the Lord? I was just going crazy in our, in our house. And as we were going through this, the question came up as we tried to lead our church. What do we do? How do we keep our bodies in, our body encouraged? How do we exhort people? So we started doing Zoom meetings. We started doing uh, WhatsApp messages. We, we started doing all kinds of things. But at a certain point, here, guys, something hit us as elders. We took Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. You want to put that up on the screen? Look what it says. I'm going to try to turn this. I hope my, my Bible doesn't fall over. Therefore, again, based in the context, it's talking about the chapter 11, the giants of faith. Since we have these great examples, we are, excuse me, we are surrounded by such great clouds of witnesses. Let us throw aside everything that hinders and take note, it says, and the sin. You know what that is making reference to? The sin of doubt. Throw away doubt, the doubt uh, that so easily entraps us and let us run with perseverance. I appreciate what that sister said about perseverance. The race marked out for you. And here's what we did. Let us focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perf uh, perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the throne of grace, guys, by the way. He sat down, meaning it's over. There's no more need to do sacrifices. There's no more need to try to do it all in your, in your own effort. Jesus at the cross finished the course. And we are sitting here today because of what he did. Okay, and then it goes on to say, uh, consider him who endured the cross in uh, such opposition from sinful men so that you take note will not grow weary and lose heart how do you keep going when you're tired i'm not talking about tired physically so if you're tired physically what do you do go to bed for about two months especially with COVID, you can't go out turn on your computer <laughs> You go to sleep. How do you regroup when you're spiritually tired and you're emotionally drained? You fix your eyes on Jesus. And as a church, as a family, we had to say, okay, he's on the throne. This battle is real, but how are we going to get through this? And again, as pastor of the church thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to hold everything together? And in March, God showed us how he was going to do it. Everybody knows Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham has a real heart for Italy. He decided to come with his tent and set it up in Cremona when nobody was coming to our aid. We were all by ourselves. And want to put up that next verse, please? He took this verse, bear one another's burdens so, so you fulfill the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? That's a concept where Jesus says, love each other, love the world. Make yourself an instrument in his hands 
because that's how this thing missions is going to be done. So March 12th, he comes to Italy with this tent. Came in with 75 people, set up this huge tent and spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. And you know what happened? The day they put the tent down, all of Italy heard evangelicals have come to our aid. Nobody was coming. We didn't have any idea what to do. We were isolated. We saw whole generations being dying of, of, of COVID. And here we are, everybody's saying, what's this thing, COVID? Do we need a mask? Do we not need a mask? How are we going to, should we stay by, we can't go by each other. And Franklin came in with his team of servants. And you know what they said? They said, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're here to serve you. You know what it says in Matthew 5, 14? It says, let your light shine amongst men so that they will see your good works and give glory to the Father. That's what happened that day. All of a sudden, where we were marginal evangelicals, 1% of the country are evangelicals, all of a sudden, we're on every television, every station, every newspaper. The evangelicals have come because they love us. Guys, you see how when, when, when you're in a storm and your whole world is falling apart, God still is working. And he t he's taken this horrible thing, COVID, and is bringing glory to himself. Well, it just so happens that my son-in-law, Michael, who's a missionary in this church, was called to be the chaplain at the Graham tent. And he spent three months there serving. He led a lot of people to the Lord. And then I got a phone call from my granddaughter, Glory, 25 years old. Hey, Grandpa, I'm going down to the tent in Cremona. I said, to do what? She said, to translate and help. And I wanted to turn to the Lord and say, okay, I can understand my son-in-law. I can understand me. But my granddaughter, God used her to lead people to the Lord. And now, again, Vauxhall, New Jersey. And here I am telling you these stories. But the, I think the main thing I want to do to encourage you is how do you keep going when you are weary? How do you keep doing what God wants you to do when everything and we have, in this past 18 months, has been a tough period of time, guys. And here's the, I'm going to put up the next. This is Galatians chapter 6. Verses 7 through 9. I'm going to read it. And I just want to share with you this morning. A things we learned on how to keep your focus when you're tired. How do you keep your focus on the world, which is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, when you think, I'm tired. Does that command still apply during a COVID period? How do we keep serving the Lord when COVID hits, and look what it says here. Do not be deceived. God can, cannot be mocked. The man, a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit the spirit, uh, the spirit will reap, he will reap eternal life. There's the focus of, there's two lives. 
a person chooses to just say, I'm going to live my own life, I'm going to do my own thing, you reap the harvest. I look at my family. I, I'm the, I was the first Christian in my family. And I look, I think, wow, my kids are happy. My cousins have some problems. But guys, what it says here is the one who, take note, key word, the one who lives to please the spirit, uh, he will reap eternal life. Take note. doesn't say immortality. It says eternal life. What does that mean? You know what it means? It means the one who lives by the spirit will have an abundant, fruitful, reward, whatever the word is, rewarding Christian life. Fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. And Paul is saying, look, there's, you can have this life and you can have this life. But he doesn't say just eternal life. Now he goes on and clarifies it. And he says, look, verse 12 and 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will, will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Here's what I want to help encourage you. First principle, that in order to not grow weary, keep in mind that God has a plan. He has a plan to reach this world, and he has a plan. Listen to me very carefully. He has a plan to use you if you're available, not just because he has a global plan for the whole world. You know something? You are very unique in God's eyes. Some people are more unique than others. John always says, you're unique, Sam. I say, I'm the standard for uniqueness, in other words. But the point is, God has made you in a certain way. And he's going to use you if you're available, to accomplish his plan. And he is always working. This passage, you want to put up the next slide, please? Let me ask you a question. If you do not see God working, is this promise still valid? If he says, you will reap a harvest. If we don't see something, does that mean there's nothing going on? No. His word, he's faithful to his word. And he's, he's doing things to bring glory to himself, get the message out to the world. And he is working even again. If you're in the middle of this tempest, you're not standing alone. God has got something for you, and he's working through you. We, John and I, came back uh, last September, was it, John? Yeah. We came back next last September for two, two months, as soon as COVID allowed us to get out of Italy. I came back in, and I just thought, oh, just do a little bit of ministry. Well, everything got shut down here. In Italy, everything was shut down. So we said, well, we'll go back to Italy. Well, our kids called us from Europe. Our church called us saying, don't come back. COVID is full-blown at your age. Why don't you just stay for a couple more months? So we thought, okay, we'll stay until Christmas. And then get back for Christmas. They had some ministries. Well, Christmas came, and again, everything was going crazy. We're saying we have to get back. We have never in our whole life ever spent Christmas away from our kids. We, our church has all kinds of things going on. And I'm thinking, I want to go back. And Jonah's saying, we have to go back. And we tried, and it just sort of nothing worked out. December 28th, we were sitting at home. I had just bought a 
high blood pressure machine. I know it's hard to believe that I could have high blood pressure, but <laughs> I have high blood pressure. So Joan said, why don't you check your blood pressure? I put it on, it was 140 over, over 90. That's, that's good for me. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little bit higher. And, and I said, Joan, why don't we take yours? We took it the first time, it was 150 over 85. Oh, this is a little bit high. Took it again about 10 minutes later. It was 190 over 110. Now, I took out the book for the high blood pressure machine and said, you know, do this, this, I'm checking. It says when you get to over 200, go to the hospital immediately. She got to 220 over 120. Well, we got in, the, got in the car and went right down to Hunter the Medical Center. Had to drop Joan off. She didn't even have her phone with her. I couldn't go in. I didn't see her for four days. They found out that she has a, a cardiac bridge, which is the, the veins don't go through the right way. But they also found out that she has an enlarged aorta. And they said, you know, so they put it in her. She spent two weeks in the hospital. And I thought, oh, Lord. And then the light went on. Now we know why God kept us here until after Christmas. And then I'm preaching in, I thought, okay, we're ready to go back. I'm preaching in a church. Shook the hand of a doctor friend of mine. And he said, hey, what's that spot on your arm? I said, I don't know. I've had it a couple of years. He said, come and see me tomorrow. I went in. He did the test. Friday night, Saturday night, about uh, 10 o'clock, I get a phone call. Oh, Dave, I'm sorry. It's my doctor. I think I, think I butt dialed you. I do it all the time. And he said, no, you didn't butt dial me. I'm calling you. You know that spot you have on your arm? It's a basal cell cancer. And I thought, okay, how do we resolve this? Two weeks later, I went to him. They took it all out. And listen, guys. If we had gone back to Italy and went into that situation with all emergencies closed, I'm not sure if Joan would be alive, and I'm for sure I would not have had this checked. But you see, God had his plan for us and he was working in spite of what all this craziness of being here and, and not getting back. The exciting thing was when I got back to Italy on a Friday, I did an evangelistic campaign on a Saturday that was like, <laughs> I, I didn't plan that, but they said, you're back here, Sam, why don't you do this? Evangelism for us. So I said, okay. You see, guys, how do you keep your focus when things are going bad? First of all, you have to remember that God is on the throne and you are very unique in his eyes. And his plan for you is different than his plan for Noah or John or Mark. You're not a forgotten person. God knows what he's doing. It's, Sam, I know it, but I feel like my world is falling apart. Here's the second thing you should do. Put it up there. God's timing is always perfect. You want to put the verse up too? Look what it says. Uh, do not feel, uh, do not grow weary in doing good and that means just keep doing what you're doing in spite of what everything looks like don't give up for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you don't give up you know what that is saying God's timing is perfect for everything he wants to do amen, amen? He lives outside of time. We live in time. And you see, we have this parameter in our life. We're born here 
live 50, 60, 70, 80 years. This is our parameter. And we have to filter and try to figure everything out from the time concept of we, what we live in. Since God is outside of time, his plan is that I will do it at the proper time. Now, the question comes up, what's the proper time? Right? It's easy. God's timing. All right, his timing, not ours. When I left to go to Italy back in 1940, uh, 1980, I was the only believer in my family. I thought, Lord, how could I go to Italy, leave my family? And then none of them are believers. Is this what I should do? And God said, Sam, you walk by faith. Don't put parameters or barriers around my plan for your life. And I'll tell you this. I've been here 41 years, and I've seen just about everybody in my family come to know the Lord. Apart from me at times. I was walking over in, in Laurel Avenue in, in Vauxhall. Saw a guy there, and he said, hey, you're a Fiore. I said, yeah, I'm a Fiore. And he said, well, I'm so-and-so. And I started witnessing to him. He started witnessing to me. And he said, oh, what about your father, Sam, and your Uncle Joe? And I said, well, most of them have come, but I'm not sure what happened to two uncles, my Uncle Mingi and my Uncle Tony. And he looked at me and said, Sam, I led both of them to the Lord in the hospital. I'm thinking, isn't it incredible? How God does that thing. And just recently, I was talking to my niece who lives in Atlanta. And my sister died of cancer at the age of 41, brain cancer. And before dying, she accepted the Lord. And she said, Sam, we have to witness to our family. We have to get everybody. I said, Nina, uh, Nina Marianne, I'm trying. So we started praying for her kids. Seven years ago, my niece calls me up while I'm in Italy saying, Uncle Sam, I just prayed to receive Jesus, and I want to let you know. I said, well, praise the Lord. And she just came down with cancer recently. So she called me up to talk to me. And I said, by the way, how's your father, how, how was he when he died? He died about six months ago. She said he became a believer. There was a guy who hated the gospel, made fun of me, and said, I am going to be, go where my friends are in hell. 41 years later, God calls him to himself. Are you waiting for something? You see, God has a plan for you. He has the proper time for that plan. And here's the, the really an incredible thing. He's got his way of doing it. You want to put that up, please? Okay, the verse two. Look what it says. So, then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are in the household of faith. You see, as we're sort of just walking along, resting in faith, waiting for God to answer, we have to realize that as opportunities come up, just look to share your faith. You have to have a dual vision when we talk about a church. And I appreciate it what uh, Noah said. As a church, you focus on union, you serve each other, you help each other. But at the same time, as God opens up doors, we should make ourselves available. And again, how do you see what God is doing? First of all, you have to have a heart to see what he's doing. And second of all, you have to have eyes to see. I walked into my entranceway in Milano about six years ago. I looked on the wall and I said to Joan, hey Joan, 
that's a really beautiful picture. And she said, oh, you like it? And with that tone of voice after 35 years of, uh, 55 years of being married, you know you shouldn't have said that. So uh, how do you get out of it, guys? You find yourself in a hole and everything's closing in on you. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. She said, you like it? I said, oh, where'd you get it? She said, I bought it when I was in Sweden with you. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, Sweden. We teach at a Bible school up there. And I'm thinking, okay, now what's the next question? Oh, oh, yeah, right. Where's it been for the last eight years? Right in that spot there. <laughs> Jesus says in John chapter 4, look unto the fields. Oh, no, he says, open your eyes and look unto the fields for they are white on the harvest. Have you ever tried to look at something without opening your eyes? How do you look? But Jesus has said, look and open your eyes. You know what he's saying? He is working. He's doing things. And just make yourselves available, especially with this COVID. We have this couple in our church who, when COVID hit, new Christians, they felt like they had to share their faith with someone. So they heard of their neighbor who was about three stories down. It was an elderly lady who had nobody to take care of her. So they just decided to bring food to her. Started bringing food, talking to her about the Lord. After about three months, they were praying together and Mario said to his wife, we have to go talk to our neighbor about Jesus in a clear way. They made some food, went down, sat down and started talking and Lee, uh, Lija, excuse me, that was one. sat down and just shared the gospel with this lady. And she said, would you like to receive Jesus as your savior? And the woman said, yes, I would. Praise God. They prayed, they talked, they cried together. The next day, they go down to bring more food. And the lady had already died. God's perfect timing, allowing our friends as God opens doors. You share what God is doing in your life, and then you start having ramifications and a cause and effect. Her son, who couldn't get to see her, said to my friends, you evangelicals are angels. You have ministered to my mother and she was at peace when she died. You see, here's the way it works. God calls us to himself. He has a plan for your life and he's working. He's doing something. Don't give up, guys. Don't grow weary. And keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And so that as he opens up doors, you could be God's instrument 